Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon in the East Coast of the United States and good evening in Europe. My name is Julia Friedlander. I'm the Seaboy and Gray Senior Fellow and Director of the Economic Statecraft Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. And today we get to discuss one of my favorite topics, uh, which is economic statecraft, right? Um, and the impact of everything that's happened over the past couple of weeks with regards to Russia. I am thrilled to welcome a wonderful panel each of, uh, each of these people are well-established, published, and outspoken uh, in their fields. And so I think we're gonna have a wonderful conversation today. We have Dan Dresner from Tufts University. We have Jonathan Hackenbreit from the European Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin, and Carla Norloff from the University of Toronto. I think what to start off, we always say that this, these measures are unprecedented, what, we, we, what we've done with Russia from building off measures we had in 2014, debt and equity prohibitions, blocks on entities and individuals, to the banking sanctions, to the conversations about de-swifting. And then of course, the big red button of freezing Russia's foreign exchange reserves, cutting off their access to 60% of, um, of their reserves essentially overnight. And I think that, you know, we've been, we're trying to read the tea leaves to see what are the economic impacts going to be, what are, of course, the impacts going to be on the war itself. But I think it's also important to take a step back and think from a more academic perspective, how do we use these tools? How do they intersect with foreign policy goals? And what are the longer term implications? So I'm just going to start here by asking each of our panelists to make a brief opening, uh, some brief opening remarks. Please put your questions in the Q&A function and I will get to them uh, in due, due course of the conversation. So I'm just going to go alphabetically here. Uh, so Dan, I'm going to start with you. Thank you very much, Julian. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess I have, I'll just say three quick sort of, you know, uh, initial reactions to the what we've seen so far in terms of the sanctions imposed against Russia. The first is the degree actually of, I think, legitimately tactical surprise. The fact that um, the central bank uh, reserves were frozen, I think, caught everyone, honestly, uh, by surprise, particularly the Russians, because I think, and in some ways, it's almost a shame that they didn't think that this could happen, because that might have actually functioned as a potential deterrent. I mean, one of the things we have to acknowledge is that the threat of sanctions prior to the invasion failed as a deterrent. It didn't stop um, Vladimir Putin from invading Ukraine. Um, and it was clear that that was the principal uh, sort of coercive tool in, in the U.S.'s arsenal in the negotiations before the actual invasion. Um, but the fact that they were then uh, imposed and, and caught Russia by surprise, I think, has probably aided and embedded um, the economic impact that they were intended. Um, the second thing I think is that I'm a little wary of, well, no, sorry. The second thing is that something that has legitimately surprised me in terms of the sanctions has been not so much what's actually been imposed, but the ways in which the private sector has gone above and beyond what was imposed. Um, we've talked a lot over the last decade about how financial sanctions lead some companies to engage in de-risking um, in which they sort of uh, reduce activity beyond what legally they're required to do. I think with Russia, we're seeing something slightly different. There's that element of de-risking, but there is also this sense that a lot of firms are doing this because lots of other firms are doing this. Um, and they therefore want to avoid the stigma of being seen as cooperating or engaging in, in ordinary economic activity, which has been conflated in, as cooperating with Putin. Um, and so as a result, in a lot of ways, I think the private sector activity is going to be far more impactful than what we've seen publicly. Um, I don't know how long Russian planes are going to be able to fly in the air um, without Boeing or Airbus providing uh, servicing. Uh, we don't know the ability of uh, them to trade if Maersk or MSC are not going to dock in Russian ports. Um, you know, you saw pictures of, of sort of Russians trying to uh, get the last Big Mac out of McDonald's and so forth. Um, so I, I think the economic impacts uh, of these are, have yet to be anticipated. But the other cautionary note on this is that precisely because the private sector has gone, gone above and beyond what the sanctions have entailed, we don't know when they might choose to reverse course. And so that leads to interesting questions about the sustainability of this sanctions uh, effort over time. And that gets related to the conditions under which the sanctions might actually be lifted. And that's one issue that I have 
talked about at least a little bit in some of my, my writing, which is it's not clear to me exactly yet what Russia has to do to have sanctions either partially or completely lifted. Um, and one of the dangers in terms of the way the United States engages in economic sanctions is that for them to be effective, you need to make two kinds of credible commitment. First, you need to credibly commit that if the targeted actor violates some rule or, or goes across some red line, um, you will impose sanctions. But the, the flip side of that is that the target also has to believe that if they actually make concessions, the sanctions will be lifted. Um, and the United States has been really, really bad uh, at lifting sanctions um, over the last decade for a variety of reasons that have a lot to do with domestic politics um, and, and concerns about being seen as too dovish towards some states in, in the ways in which sanctions will be lifted. Um, the last thing I would, would say is that what strikes me is that the sanctions against Russia are significant enough so that we're seeing second order effects across the global economy. Um, you know, we see this in the form of skyrocketing wheat prices. That's as much due to the war in Ukraine, but it's also going to have an effect on Russia. Um, the fact that you see the United States now engaging in potential talks with Venezuela uh, to accommodate those sanctions somewhat to bring Venezuelan oil on the market in a way potentially displacing Russian oil. And indeed, in, in terms of the JCPOA, uh, with Russia trying to um, extract some sort of, of uh, carve out, um, although it's not entirely clear what they want with, with the JCPOA, um, but that might actually hold up uh, that agreement being implemented. Um, I think that was appropriate from the 10,000 you know, foot view. I can, I can stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan. There we go. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Julia. And uh, really, really glad to be here. Hi from Berlin, everyone. Um, uh, I guess uh, I thought what I'd do was uh, uh, would be to to look a little bit on the on the European side of things and and how how Europe uh, uh, went about this jointly with the with the U.S. and how well how how, how well we we uh, we coordinated this uh, across uh, the Atlantic and um, and I think uh, <clears throat> what what happened here uh, basically overnight even though there were there were. Uh, uh, quite a few weeks to prepare and i'll come to that in a second of, uh, of course uh was is, is sort of a geoeconomic revolution if you will um uh, and and uh, symbolically uh, for that stands stand export controls i would say um uh, i remember discussions in europe uh, over the last years um uh, about the use of export controls the uh, observing from europeans looking across the atlantic but also increasingly to to beijing uh what um, uh, what was what was going on? New export control law, ECRA, etc., um, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, and 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 the view was mostly still that export controls, you know, um, uh, for geopolitical purposes, was was something that that was uh, at least viewed difficult uh, with with difficulty and, and so forth. Uh, it's also a competency with member states. Uh, you have some, you know, you have some some uh, uh, dual use, uh, um, a, a dual use list and coordination on, on dual use on the European level before. But then overnight, when this happened, uh, and of course jointly with the US uh, and and others, um, uh, what all twenty seven member states agreed on was was a centralized European export control regime, uh, and um, uh, one sufficient enough uh, and 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 so well coordinated with the with the US that uh, uh, that. The U.S. Um, uh, car, uh, put in a carve out uh, for Europe on extraterritory on the extraterritorial application of its export controls, um, uh, and that's a sort of a good. Um, uh, it, it is representative of what of what happened all of a sudden. We had great unity of all twenty seven. Something that I would add to Dan's list that something if had that been a little clearer, even though I thought, always thought that was clear, certainly for such a scenario that, that we're lo looking at now, um, then maybe the deterrent the, the deter and our credibility would, would have been a little better, even that there would be no one, one European uh, member state that would, um, uh, you know, that, that would uh, block uh, sanctions in, in such a scenario. Um, uh, and, um, and what's also interesting was that this was centrally coordinated in Brussels, came uh, the commission uh, in that that sometimes is criticized for silos and 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 you know uh, di distinctions uh, between trade policy, financial sanctions policy, um, uh, uh, with, and then you know the differences between between Brussels and member states. 
proposed these measures was in close coordination with member states and uh, and they uh, and and I think uh, everyone is very happy about how swiftly and and almost surprised some some people might be surprised about how swiftly Europe Europe could act. Um, uh, so that's that. But um, I would say that what you, many Europeans now are wondering, though, is that how exceptional that a, a situation that is. Um, uh, so you know, imagine uh, uh, Putin had made less mistakes. And we always said that if on coercion, economic coercion, the best thing you can do as a third state is is to make sure you don't unite all Europeans against yourself. And 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 uh, so so maybe you, you don't make a speech about Nazis and, and drug addicts and and about the fact that uh, you want to eradicate an entire country of the world's map uh, and so forth. Uh, but then also some we we don't we can't expect that always you, we have weeks to prepare jointly um, uh, across the Atlantic and 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 in such great ways. Um, uh, there's also of course the fact that. Uh, dividing divisive factor, and we've talked about that a lot, um, uh, of course, in the debate. But uh, it's easily that um, that sanctions, be it third country sanctions or, or you know, or, or, or measures uh, like like Russia's, or um, the, the EU's own sanctions, uh, hit sectors, regions, countries asymmetrically, and that's a, that can easily be a divisive factor, and so forth and so forth. And uh, if we're honest. Um, uh, we could, we could have started wargaming the situation at, at the latest when uh, when there was a troop buildup in 2021 at the at the Ukrainian border and figured out that energy dependency is a is a huge issue um, uh, uh, and uh, and and so forth. So uh, all of that is leading, I think, to the fact that Europeans will be will double down on the effort of building an economic deterrent based on qualified majority um, uh, anti coercion instrument. Um, uh, possibly build up an economic security office, something like that, in, in the Commission uh, to much better uh, uh, coordinate and prepare across issues and um, and uh, and reform other tools. Uh, and and I think export controls is something to watch as well. I'll I'll stop there, but uh, lots to say on other issues as well. But I thought that that might be interesting uh, to to give you the the European perspective. Thank you so much. Um, and over to Carla from sunny Toronto. Uh, thank you very much, um, Julia and the Atlantic Council for having me, and uh, I really enjoyed the comments both by, by Dan and, and Jonathan. And so I will, I will try to say something slightly different and focus on the risks um, and some risks that I actually do uh, think exist, but also some that I think have been exaggerated. And so the, some of this actually hooks up to the uh, economic statecraft report that I did last year for for the Atlantic Council and the Geoeconomic Centre, and it 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 concerns these economic responses to security challenges, and um, they do not actually make security risks go away, and they also create certain economic risks. Uh, there's a security risk because those who cannot respond with economic uh, instruments will tend to respond with military instruments and, um, and even escalate uh, that kind of uh, military confrontation. And we see that now playing out with Russia in terms of kind of bringing this into a you know, kind of this security game and uh, you know, flirting with a, a nuclear response. And the economic risk is what I call a security motivated decoupling where there's decoupling from countries to prevent them from acquiring um, military technology and military uh, commitment. And of course, uh, and this is something that the United States has also pursued you know, to, to a certain extent with China. And um, that really poses risks also for economic uh, interdependence. Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, if this is uh, something that, you know, is in the cards for uh, a larger set of countries, then we will see the unraveling of um, the uh, economic order, perhaps in slow, slow motion, but it really is a step away from the type of economic order that we had before, where economics and security were more uh, separate. And I think that these two trends are likely to go, uh, grow stronger. Then I uh, also think that there's there's a risk in you know how we speak and think about um, economic statecraft in this context. You know we're clearly seeing you know very large scale damage 
and it's accomplished using coercive means uh, other than war. But I think that other is the operative word here. Um, the, the US and the Allied response towards Russia is an economic response. It's, you know, trigger charge sanctions, export controls, and really aims to degrade the, the, the Russian economy. Um, and these instruments, they, you know, they have the capacity, the possibility, they promise the possibility to deter and compel, you know, actors into submission under some uh, circumstances, but they are not, uh, they are not weapons. And I think the big risk going forward um, is to rely on them to achieve the same thing that might be achieved using military means. Um, and because they are not military uh, instruments, um, I think that we should, you know, kind of see them on this kind of continuum between diplomacy and war. And the option of actually using an, a military uh, instrument should not be taken off uh, the table in the way that the Biden administration um, has done. And I think that when we kind of uh, talk about everything as a potential weapon, you know, we kind of lose sight of the fact that these are distinct uh, instruments and possible escalation uh, to more militarized responses. So I think that that really was a big uh, strategic blunder. And I wonder to what extent it was, you know, it occurred because of the way that we, the, the language that we have used to, uh, to, to think about economic statecraft and the possible responses. Um, you know, I, I also think that really here we're seeing kind of the, you know, in the, in the background, um, you know, a, you know, a great power kind of um, reckoning. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Biden and Z are, are meeting tomorrow. And this comes right after Russia uh, threatened uh, the US, uh, you know, yesterday and, you know, po promised, you know, kind of an official reorientation away from the West to China. And so the, I think that the immediate goal really is to discourage uh, uh, Chinese support of the Russian war effort. But I think the long-term uh, US goal might be to drive a wedge between China and Russia. So weakening Russia and then intensify contact with China to make them reassess their partnership with Russia and thereby weaken any kind of long-term um, alliance um, uh, with, with, uh, between uh, Russia uh, and China. In a way, this is also what the, what the United States did during the Cold War, but the other way around. So, um, in terms of the risks that I think have been exaggerated, I think that, you know, there's a lot of talk now about, you know, these moves triggering, you know, alternatives in particular to the dollar centric financial system. And I just don't see the same impetus towards this precisely because there's a concerted effort um, to, uh, you know, punish uh, Russia and uh, to ca compel uh, Russia to to end the war, and you know it's a very strong signal that basically you know don't invade other countries because you know this might happen to you as well. And I don't think you know the West is you know there's some 50 countries that Russia has designated as hostile as a result of stepping up behind uh, sanctions. So clearly these countries are not interested in developing alternatives to the to the dollar centered financial system, although, you know, there will be some countries who, you know, maybe plan to invade other countries or plan to do bad things that will um, try to um, uh, try to um, develop long term ways to work around the dollar system. Um, you know, but it's very different from, you know, when this was on the table, um, you know, after the um, uh, the, the, the kind of the U.S. Uh, closing of the Iran nuclear deal, where the Europeans were, you know, seriously on board and trying to, you know, carve out a separate space, um, you know, using the euro. That that's not that's not the kind of conversation that we're having now. And so would it would it would be an alternative system that really did not use major currencies, and that's a very different proposition. So I think that those are the, my remarks for now. 
Thank you, Carla. That's a lot to dive into from all of you. I mean, Carla, I mean, the two of us have been discussing this use of the of the terminology of warfare to apply to financial mechanisms. And I, I agree um, that it can be, it's a dangerous precedent to set. But I do think we are, and again, because of in, in the current moment, um, that it does apply because of the tactical nature of trying to physically stop a war that has started with the measures that you employ. Um, Dan, what does that say to you about, you know, about, about the viability of, uh, of sanctions, about some of these measures, right? I mean, you've written about this in the past, about the, um, the, you know, the, the you know, overusing them or overpromising, but, you know, does that apply now? Yeah, I think it absolutely applies now. In fact, if anything, it applies with greater force now because, you know, the, the evolution of sanctions over the last 20 years, I think, um, has been that the way I would put it is that the technology of sanctions has improved significantly. Um, you know, I, I think Jeffrey Schott once said that, you know, we've moved from an undergraduate uh, understanding of sanctions to a postgraduate one. And indeed, the reliance on financial sanctions in particular has sort of flipped the script in terms of private sector activity. It used to be that when we imposed trade sanctions, that sort of incentivized sanctions busting activities by the private sector because you're outlawing what would otherwise be ordinary market activity. Whereas by using the financial channel, um, you've seen actors in some ways, private sector actors go above and beyond. Um, so there is no denying that the sanctions that we impose now are far more punishing uh, in terms of economic cost than, than the sanctions that were imposed even you know, 25 years ago. The problem, I think, is that the technology of sanctions is improved, but our political understanding of what they can accomplish and what they can't uh, has effect, actually, if anything, I would argue devolved slightly um, in the sense that I, I think what happened is, is that everyone became extremely enthusiastic of, oh, wow, we have this tool that is exceptionally potent now. Um, in a way that we didn't think it was before. And hey, look, we tried this with Iran and we actually managed to get what we wanted in terms of the JCPOA. And therefore, this could actually be applied to a whole you know, wide array of cases without realizing that, the, as Carla put it, these are not, they actually are in some way, they, they originated with military instruments. I'm going to hold up actually a book that is not mine, but I'm going to advertise it, um, an extremely timely book that just came out by yeah. Nicholas Mulder called The Economic Weapon, um, pointing out that in fact, the modern origin of sanctions was World War I and that they were seen as an adjunct to war, not just uh, as a substitute for it. Um, but basically expecting economic sanctions to force another great power to give up territory is operating in fantasy land. It's not going to do that. Um, and what we have wound up doing is applying sanctions to a wide variety of instances where the ask that we are making of countries is one that they will not acquiesce to. They simply will not, which means we need to think about, OK, if they're not, that can lead to one of two reactions. The first is either you need to calibrate your demands. So, well, three reactions. Either you need to, to, to lower your demand somewhat so that the, the, the ask is conceivable for the target state. The second is you need to be willing to use means in addition to economic statecraft to get what you want, which would mean military statecraft in this instance. Um, or the third possibility, and this is not one that I'm necessarily dismissing, but I think is, is something going forward, is, OK, you are no longer in a position where you were engaged in economic coercion. This is actually a, an instance of economic containment. Um, and that's a, a different long term question. And if that's the case, then you need to figure out how you can have sustainable sanctions, um, because what is implemented in the enthusiasm of what we've seen over the last month might not necessarily be sustainable. They also might be. I mean, I think this is where, you know, government action um, in terms of close coordination with the private sector can actually make a difference. But the expectation that sanctions alone, no matter how crippling they are to the Russian economy, is going to force Russia out of Ukraine, I, I think is an illusion. It's, it's you know, the way to, to put it. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is the best shot we have, though? Um, no, I think it's it's part of the best shot. Um, I do. This is where I do think, you know, what the, the thing that is going to change Russia's mind on Ukraine is not the sanctions. The sanctions can can play a, a, a supporting role. It's going to be what happens on the ground. So the extent to which the Ukrainians become better armed, um, the extent to which Ukraine can impose damage on the Russian army. I think we all said that New York Times story last night that suggested the Russians have already lost, you know, by conservative estimates, 7,000 soldiers. That's a massive amount. Um, 
those are the things that are going to change Russia's mind. The sanctions can play a, a supporting role in that, but it's not going to play the primary role. And I would also add one last thing on this, which is I, I think there was a hope particularly in the first wave of sanctions that, you know, it, there was a way in which it really almost acted the way social media does in which like, oh, look, they've gotten on board and they've gotten on board. And, you know, it's sort of a contagion effect to show, see, everyone opposes the sanctions. And I really do think that this led to some to believe that this would also cause ordinary Russians to rise up um, and potentially overthrow Vladimir Putin, because in some ways that would be the easiest out. The easiest out is Putin is no longer running Russia, which allows them to gracefully back down. I think what people are are perhaps misreading is the possibility that the sanctions will actually um, bolster Putin's domestic standing rather than weaken it. Um, that this will lead to a rally around the flag effect in the in Russia, just as by the way, it's led to a, a small rally around the flag effects elsewhere from the sanctioning countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say that you know maybe it won't stop. You know what what we can you know my, my hopeful scenario is uh, this. Um, you know we we arm Ukraine. And as the war, war and the insert and Russia's fighting an insurgency that they can no longer finance. Right. Um, so that's you know that's that's the, the sort of corner of my heart that I that I retreat to every night. Um, uh, Carla, you have a you have a two finger, right? Yeah. So you know, I, I don't necessarily disagree with uh, a lot of what uh, Dan just said. I think we're just talking about it in slightly different ways. I also agree that you know to think that. Um, you know, the, that sanctions um, can deter a great power from doing something that it already did half a decade ago and that it's mobilized to do is, you know, to expect too much. Um, I haven't read uh, Mulder's book. I look forward to reading it. Um, and, you know, I, sanctions might be, uh, you know, a supplement to, uh, you know, to military instruments, but a lot of things are a supplement to, uh, to military, like diplomacy is also a supplement to military instruments. So that, that, that's not, you know, where I see the problem. I see, um, you know, a problem in you, in using um, the same kind of metaphor as, you know, what one would expect from a military confrontation. And I think what it's done is it's, it's created, you know, this illusion that, that you say that you that you want to prevent that, that they can accomplish the same thing as a military uh, threat or a, a military repost, a, a military confrontation. Um, and also to think that, well, we never need to go down that road. And that's precisely what happened in the Biden administration, kind of taking that option out of the equation. Um, you know, and that's my worry that there's there's no possibility of escalation if you equate these two uh, instruments so that financial sanctions actually become an endpoint, whereas there is a continuum to a higher level, a level of escalation. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, uh, Jonathan, turning back to you, um, one thing that Carla mentioned, though, is uh, now we're we're going to talk to the Chinese about to try to um, disincentivize their working with with the Russians. Uh, two, two months ago, we were doing the opposite. We were trying to talk to the Russians about not working with the Chinese. I mean, we, and, and now we're um, uh, the there are you know I think as Dan mentioned, where there are some talk tentative talks with the Venezuelans about um, uh, about bringing oil back on that we shut out and then it, the, bought from the Russians. I mean, again, we're playing God a little bit here in, in, in sort of political terms, I think about who we think we can peel off from whom and when. Um, so from, from your perspective, um, how much does this throw the anti-coercion instrument and the plans there off course or, or does it augment them? And, you know, does, you know, now that, now that, um, that the European Union is taking such a, a remarkable stance on Russia, also incurring, to incur economic costs from that as well, are we going to see when, you know, are we going to see the same sort of growing enthusiasm about the TTC and all of that, those other aspects that were essentially China focused? Good, good question. Um, uh, I, I think so. I think I think this is um, it's it, I couldn't think of I mean, there would be and but I don't want to think of, of uh, uh, even starker um, uh, uh, things or, 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 or um, uh, events that would that would drive the point home, home to Europeans and uh, uh, that, you know, the world of, of easy globalization, the times of easy globalization are over. This is a much more geopolitical world that they that they're um, uh, that they're in. 
and uh, and and how valuable, uh, just how valuable the transatlantic relationship is. All of that is, you know, is being illustrated to them very clearly um, uh, uh, at at this point. Um, to a point that I even sometimes wonder if if there's not a risk of, you know, um, uh, uh, that. Um, you know, we, we've seen the Titan vendor, the big, the big, uh, big change in, in on military spending in Germany and so forth. But what's so far lacking still is is uh, uh, doctrine and the strategic thinking that you need you, you you need to accompany it with, because what we're actually seeing now is that um, is is that um, uh, uh, the, all, in all of Germany's post-war history, it could it could outsource a good chunk of that thinking and and, and security um, to the U.S. And, and and that's working really well at the moment. So, uh, uh, but, but but that's that's uh, that's just a point on the side, but. Um, I think there's going to be yeah renewed impetus. Uh, I think uh, some of some of the, you had some countries in Eastern Europe who weren't sure that weren't sure about the anti-coercion instrument. Uh, I think to them it's very clear now um, uh, that they that they're long, have to brace for long-term economic war um, uh, and and that, that how 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 much of a threat that can be. Um, now, in retrospect, also not that that's the only thing that drove energy prices before the invasion, but but Russia's behavior on energy markets, I think, is clearly now was 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 a, a partial preparation for war, and and you know and, and putting a little bit more of a squeeze on Europeans. So I think there's there's lots of things that are um, uh, that are pointing into that direction, and and and. Um, uh, and 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 giving impetus to it to everything that's going on in the in, in, in the TTC on reviewing also to a degree you know what is the what is the gas in relations with Russia um, uh, 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 those things are are going to happen on specific instruments I mean you mentioned um, at, uh, when we when we talked earlier outbound investment screening for instance which I know is is, is a big debate in in the US. You know there there are big obstacles uh, in, in in Europe and and Europeans um, uh, probably um, uh, need to think about those things a lot for a long time. But as as of now, there's explicit provisions in EU treaties that 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 um, make that illegal. Also, with regards to external, you know, um, uh, you know third third countries. Um, but uh, but I think that's that's definitely the trend. I'll just. Say one thing also, but on on what Dan said, because I think there were in in the debate when after the invasion, obviously, um, because because the things were very emotional and they still are. Um, it, I, I remember um, at least one point when when things turned to swift, um, and and I saw some of the, your tweets, Julia, on on that as well, and um, uh, where. Uh, this is not a point against you know deswifting Russia. That's that's a big, uh, but but precisely about. Um, uh, how we discuss these things when when Dan says we've, we're so much better on 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 the technicalities of sanctions and so forth, but uh, but but maybe have regressed on on uh, political understanding of sanctions. There was when when de-swifting Russia and being in favor of that was the one thing that determined whether you're tough on Russia and whether uh, and whether you're you're standing united. And that probably didn't fit quite the the significance of what was going on. And I wonder if. At the moment, just given how you know, because of the major mistakes that some Europeans, certainly Germany, have made on energy policy uh, um, uh, over the last years, and just just taken that as the situation as it is, whether energy is not becoming a similar topic where it's really hard to um, uh, to argue even that uh, in Germany now to that you can't do a gas embargo right now um, uh, uh, and. Uh, but but you know that doesn't mean that Germany isn't isn't taking tough action <laughs> at the moment, and and you you have to wonder if addition if the additional benefit from that politically speaking, not in terms of economic pain, because clearly it's the big lifeline for the regime, but the the what it's actually going to change on the ground, um, uh, and whether it could not have adverse co consequences, because Nicholas Mulder in the, in his book also talks about you know there's a point in a sanctions regime where you where you increase the pressure so much that you, the regime might lash out because because one the one thing that Vladimir Putin is going to be most vigorous in, in fighting against is, is removing Vladimir Putin from uh, uh, for, you know from from the presidency or, or uh, 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 from the Kremlin. So um, uh, just how we debate these things when 
this is now so much at the center of public debate and uh, and how we um, how we can try to stay strategically wise on those is probably a big issue going forward. But you don't think that that's going to take a little bit out of the, the, the air out of the China balloon? It, I mean, I say that because I think it, it's happening here um, and I'm not sure how long it will last, but uh, but it's certainly at least the legislative calendar. So sure. It, yes and no. But I mean, I mean, what is I mean, the February 4th statement is is, uh, is is driving the point home that this is also a China issue in, in, a, in to some degree. Um, uh, I think the way Beijing has gone about all of this is, has been watched very closely from from European point of view, and it's and, it, and neutrality doesn't seem to be what what it is what it is that China is, is doing, it, even of if, if, of course economically there there are limits for the for the time being of, um, of what China is doing. Um, so no, I think I mean at least the, the way I'm perceiving the debate and, and things here, especially in Berlin, this might be a slightly more German point of view. Um, uh, but is that it's a big awakening to a much more geopolitical age, to the end of the '90s and 2000s, and you know, to the teen, to 2010s. Um, uh, how far that will go, and if the Zeitenwende is only military or or also geoeconomic, we'll see. But but that's much more what I'm sensing. I know you're going to be fighting for it to be uh, <laughs> to economic as, as would I. Um, Dan, turning turning back to you, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the sort of aspect of uh, going going too far too fast um, as and, and towards um, uh, towards provocation. There's a question about that in the chat. Jonathan just said a few minutes, but that that versus another question about um, about the about deterrence by the the, the idea of uh, that we should have preempted Putin by uh by by put, yeah putting the sanctions in place before or something so on the deterrence thing i would say two things first the idea that if we had only sanctioned putin or russia prior to the invasion it would have deterred them i think is just nonsensical it makes no sense uh in the sense that again and this goes back to the point i made before for sanctions to work as a either deterrent or compellence instrument the target has to believe that if they acquiesce or make concessions, the sanctions will be lifted or the sanctions will be no more. I guarantee you that if the United States and if the United States, first of all, I think if the United States had done this, there's no way Europe would have bought in prior to uh, prior to, to Putin moving on Ukraine. There was, I mean, there was obviously good and uh, frankly outstanding diplomatic coordination, I think, prior to uh, the invasion. But you could also see qualms on the European side about the idea of moving too quickly. Um, in, in terms of, of sanctioning Russia. And I think the nature of Russia's attack on Ukraine was one of the things that solidified the West in terms of response. Um, so if the idea that if you pre-sanctioned Russia, that would have deterred them, I, I think is insane. Um, if anything, it would have actually, I think, caused them to move more quickly. On the deterrence side, I do want to say we've been criticizing what uh, yeah, I think mildly critical about uh, aspects of the sanctions regime. I do want to say that one of the interesting questions, I think, going forward is whether this might be a case of failed deterrence against Russia, but it is interesting to consider whether this might be a successful deterrence against China. Um, because I think it is safe to say that China probably did not anticipate this degree of sanctions imposed against Russia. And since China also has irredentist territorial claims, it, it, it would be, it is interesting to see the degree, and we don't know this, but it would be fascinating to know the degree to which she and his coterie of advisors are rethinking the implications if they were to take similar action in, let's say, Taiwan or what have you. Um, and so it is possible that even if the sanctions failed as a form of deterrence against Russia, they might succeed as a form of deterrence against China. And there's a way in which that's an important you know, policy victory. Um, one last quick point I wanted to say on, on just quickly in response to Carla's point about Russia pivoting to China, which is, again, I will recommend another book uh, by my colleague at Fletcher, uh, Christopher Miller. He wrote an outstanding book called We Shall Be Masters um, about Russia's sort of fitful attention um, to the Far East whenever it gets frustrated with its relationship with Europe. Um, and if his, his analysis in that book is correct, um, its latest you know, geopolitical turn towards China will also uh, be frustrating for Moscow. And Carla, we'll bring you back in to respond to any of that that was just discussed, but I'd like to sort of um, 
direct you towards the role of currencies um, in, in, in handling um, the crisis and what this means for the role of the dollar and the role of the euro, moreover. Again, I think that, you know, it's just, um, I was doing an interview myself this morning when I was like talking to some Dutch journalists and I said, look guys, if, if the US had done this alone, the foreign exchange would have frozen 8.5% of Russia's reserves and we wouldn't have done much at all. It sort of shows that the unilateral, that this, the, this, the unilateral practice, uni practice of American sanctions really had no teeth. Um, and that it was because we locked up the assets in Europe, right, that things actually, uh, that, that we actually, um, you know, got, got them where it hurt. So, Carla, what, what, what does this say to you? Well, you know, I, I, I do think that it was a big step to, um, to, to freeze the, uh, the Russian reserves and uh, to do so in, in coordinated fashion. Um, but I think that um, despite the enormous reserves that they have uh, stacked up, you know, some uh, $650 billion worth, um, it, even if, if the central bank had not um, uh, frozen those reserves, um, it, it would have been hard for them to, you know, depending on how long they, they imagined this war effort uh, to be and what their ambitions actually are in Ukraine. I mean, is it taking all of Ukraine? Um, is it going further? Uh, it's, it's not really clear what the ambitions are uh, of, uh, of, of Russia. Uh, it, 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 it's hard to defend a currency in free fall that is being punished. Um, uh, even you know when you're fighting the major reserve currency holders, even if those uh, reserves are not frozen. So yes, I do think the short answer is I do think that you know the centrality of the of, of the dollar in the system is is basically what allows them to take these um, extreme sanction measures, right? Whether it's acting on um, the reserves of, uh, of of the countries that it's uh, sanctioning, uh, whether it's uh, you know, cutting them off from U.S. financial institutions, whether it's, uh, you know, blocking them from uh, communicating with those financial institutions, all these things are possible because of the dominance of the dollar and also because of the dominance of the United States in the financial system. So, and, and this is, brings me back to the point that I made earlier, uh, because the United States is unique in this respect, uh, the, European, the Euro countries obviously also have some of that kind of course of um, financial power, but because of the great powers like Russia uh, and also actually China uh, do not have these instruments at their disposal, uh, they're more likely to respond in other ways. And, and, and that's really what, where I think that the danger kind of lies. I, I, I completely agree also with, with the point that Dan just made that, you know, it's like, what, it, what do we consider a sanctions a success uh, in this respect? I mean, are we looking at the long-term ripple effects of this? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a really potent signaling uh, uh, effort here, right? I mean, so the United States uh, and, uh, you know, other Western countries have the means to kind of police a particular understanding of uh, international order. So there are things that are unacceptable for states to do. I mean, you cannot invade other. So national sovereignty is, you know, sacrosanct. This is one of the fundamental uh, ordering um, uh, principles of, of international order. Uh, there are also other things that, um, that, you know, you should not do, right? So it's to prevent war. It's uh, to uh, to ensure that you know um, democracies function uh, the way that they should. There are a number you know against terrorism. Whatever the principle is that you have violated, uh, you, you may expect sanctions of varying degrees. And so it does send a very strong signal to other countries what might happen if you engage in steps that are very high up. Uh, in, in, in the normative order of, you know, how the United States in particular uh, conceives um, uh, international relations. Mm -hmm. Do you think, though, that, that perhaps what we're doing now could turn into either an instructive or a cautionary tale? I mean, I mean, I, look, we're, we're, doing, we're doing everything we can, right? Not everything. We haven't touched energy yet, but 
that we we're sending we're sending Russia back uh, decades, right? And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I agree with um, with this idea of a utility curve on sanctions. Mm-hmm. How much more um, you can't um, you know Russia can't go broke more than once. You can only you know mm-hmm. can't go double broke. The, you know what you know do you what do you think about the viability of these sort of use of economic coercion in such a forceful way? Um, either if this is a, a, a wonderful success or if it's a failure um, going forward, is this a sustainable means for states to interact with each other? Um, so, you know, I, I don't expect for these types of measures to, um, you know, uh, rec- occur uh, on a continuous basis uh, in the absence of the, you know, egregious acts uh, committed by Russia, right? And so, but... Yes, you know, if, you know, and Dan alluded to this, you know, if China was thinking about, you know, hey, maybe Taiwan, yeah, I mean, well, maybe they should expect, although the situation, of course, with China is very different, uh, because China is a completely different economic player than than Russia. Uh, But there might be other countries that are looking on, and so it sends a very strong signal about um, the kinds of um, measures to uh, uh, expect uh, for, like, um, uh, uh, actions. I don't see a lot of, uh, you know, the, 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 clearly the damage to the Russian economy is so much greater uh, than any damage uh, to the West so far in the United States in particular, who is, you know, not very dependent on oil and, you know, not very dependent on economic ties um, with Russia. And as I said in my opening statement, I just don't see alternatives to the uh, to the dollar system emerging out of this particular episode because there's such unity in terms of what countries do not want uh, to happen in international order and the kind of expectations that you have of great great power actions, right? I mean, so this not, was not just any state. I mean, it's a, it's a great power uh, using overbearing force against you know, a, a, a smaller power. And so these are the kinds of things that uh, you know, uh, are not tolerated. I also think that there's a kind of a strategic uh, spin-off benefit for the United States in the longer term, rather than um, you know a, a negative risk in the sense that uh, Russia's great power status uh, is you know reduced by these actions. I mean, so in a long-term perspective, right? I mean, it's going to be very difficult for. Um, Russia to sustain its great power status, um, you know, which has to be funded economically. Um, And so in in, in that sense, I don't, you know, like there's no immediate blowback, I think, um, from this particular episode. And if you look at other uh, situations, you know, other uh, uh, instances uh, that you know, and in particular, I think that with, with Iran, the United States was out in very risky territory because they, you know, managed to alienate Europeans in the process. Um, and Europeans actually did have, uh, you know, it's like the second, it's the second major reserve currency. And, you know, since the financial market size is, you know, comparable to, um, to, to the United States. I mean, if you factor in, depending on how you factor that in, if it's the Euro countries or or you know the entire European Union, so that's a completely different ballgame. And there, I think that yes, uh, you know, if you kind of mess around with you know Western allies in that way and alienate them, then there is another type of blowback, and you know, representing a very great risk in these types of actions. Mm-hmm. So it really depends on who you're confronting. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think that that's a, it's a it's an interesting lesson about unilateralism and multilateralism. I think mm-hmm. uh, that maybe shields uh, shields us from you know from saying oh from saying oh this was a you know um, a terrible a terrible uh, policy misjudgment and therefore we can't use it again. Um, and, and I would just can I just say, Julia, I would say also the geography of, of this, right? And so you know, like you know, it's it's the multilateralism, but it's also who like who you, who is your opponent, right? Um, so you know, even if the United States were to go toe to toe and would have a unilateral action towards the Euro countries, just you know, because of the geography of this, it would be a very different type of situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very very good point. 
Um, maybe it's a bit of more, a, bit of a different tack, but also sort of has to do with geography to, to Yonatan about supply chains and, um, and about trade policy, right? So we have the, we have, an, an, we have this investment ban in place in the U.S. side, and we don't really know what that looks like yet. We also have the withdrawal of MFN status for Russia that's also in the works, and we also have um, supply chain bottlenecks, right? That are the, it has to do with some of the self-sanctioning by the by the companies, as Dan mentioned earlier. But it also, geographically speaking, you know, if you can't move, um, you know, the Turks have blocked the Bosphorus, or you know, or you can't access, you know, um, North Sea ports. That there are aspects of this that are physical. Um, what you know? How how do you read the sort of trade aspect of it when you think about global ramifications? Right. Um, good question. I think that's what's contributing to what I and, and you might be right on, on, you know, on your previous question on that, that China is sort of on, on the back burner, but it's but it is contrib contributing to the sense that I described earlier that um, you, you have to, um, uh, you know, you really have to start start thinking, especially when you talk to businesses, um, uh, uh, really start uh, changing your your um, your risk calculus and your and 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 take into account a lot more geopolitical risks than that you as Europeans, you know, given given Europe's history, thought thought that was all, that was sort of a thing of the past. Um, I think on um, uh, on yeah on supply chains, I think um, uh, what we'll see. I mean, that's that's more of a question as well. But but I think uh, you know, friend shoring um, is, uh, is is that going to be a lot more something we'll do, and and uh, um, uh, and and is that not something that again uh, reinforces the TTC and and uh, and and transatlantic relations over that? Um, uh, I think I think still an open question, which kind of tra trade order where will come out of that because I think what what there, there's a few things that are very clear um one that um that an increasing share of I mean sort of a, it's not funny but um but a, a, a funny to think maybe that um, we were always talking about decoupling from from uh, from China and and that's very gradual in some areas and now we're there, we have this rapid decoupling de decoupling from from Russia um after all even if much smaller 11th biggest economy in in the world so um uh, and and so more and more is, is more and more trade going to be power based and, and less rules based? Um, probably is this going to get give an impetus to the plurilateral rather than the multilateral um, uh, and WTO? Given we've seen also that uh, that even for this uh, U.S. administration, WTO is not is not a big priority and and reforming it. Um, uh, I think that's the sort of direction we're headed, but it's very unclear and, and much hinges on what on what the China role actually is going to be here. Um, uh, you know, for now, hands off or, or, or sort of hands off. It seems on on the economic side for, for uh, um, uh, on, on what China is doing to help to help Russia. But is that going to be true long term? Um, uh, we'll see. So so I think that's that's a, that's a key um, variable in that. Mm -hmm. But do you see, I mean, again, like the, are the trade, is the trade aspect of this just as powerful as the financial one? I mean, again, you mentioned export controls, uh, you know, that, that will have a long-term crippling effect on everything in Russia versus the financial controls, which will crash, will crash the financial system. I mean, what, what do you, I mean, again, if you weigh those, what do you, you know? <laughs> right. Cause I mean, in, in the, in in the beginning, I think I think it, it was the the added it, uh, economic pain was was sort of it, uh, you know was was not that important in the beginning. Not not of export control, but you know MFN status and and, and all that. That's very clear that that's um, yeah. It's a more more of a long term uh, more of a long term thing. Um, uh, uh, but I think on export controls uh, for sure. And and what's what um, what you. I mean, what we've seen was was a sort of the same list of technologies that the U.S. Um, uh, you know, aviation possibly well, but that's also uh, also shared. But um, uh, same list of technologies that the U.S. used. What you could see in the in the in the future on export controls could be uh, a lot more 
a, a lot more targeted certain European products, highly specialized, uh, uh, little, you know, be it Wolfs or things like that, that we could look at uh, when this when these get more sophisticated. Um, uh, uh, and, and when we use these, when, 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 when you know, if, if Europeans decide to use export controls in the future, but I think, I think the, on, on the trade uh, instruments, it's, it's more the long-term MFN status has more of a long-term impact, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and it's more the financial sanctions that are so important now. Mm -hmm. Which gets to the sort of strategy element, right? Do you end the war now through financial destruction or, Long term, as 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 Carlos says, the long term uh, deterrence via punishment. Um, we have four minutes left, um, and there, I've tried to incorporate a lot of the questions into the chat, um, into the questions that I've asked myself. So I'm going to go in reverse order now uh, for a final round of comments. Um, starting so starting with Carla, um, what what should what what should the U.S. and the EU do now? Right. What I mean, if you were again, I know you're an academic. If you were, if you were sitting in my former chair at the Treasury Department, what you know, what would you say? Yeah. You know, at at, at this point, um, uh, I think it's important to introduce some kind of face saving option that you know, will allow Russia to retreat, um, you know, thinking that it emerged victorious, right? And so one of the options that's that's been on the table is this kind of neutrality option, right? I mean, so for Ukraine to declare itself neutral, um, you know, which would satisfy the Russian demand of, um, Ukraine not 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 falling into NATO hands, becoming a NATO member. Um, that might be one variant. Um, you know, it clearly, it, it Putin personally needs to emerge from this uh, thinking that he has won. Um, and so, um, you know, I think brokering that kind of solution um, at this stage, I th I think is is. Uh, you know, is an option. I, you know, but I, I think that, you know, some ambiguity in terms of what the United States is prepared to do next would also be use, a useful accompaniment to those kinds of talks. Um, and, you know, and this goes back again, you know, a little bit to what Dan was saying before, you know, yes, you, you know, in order for sanctions to work, um, there needs to be a clear deterrent in terms of what they cannot do, right? But it all, there also needs to be some kind of reward if they actually acquiesce. Um, but I wondered, you know, to what extent it, I think that the, the, the target needs to understand that there is something that they can do in order for the pain to stop. But I'm not so persuaded um, that uh, clarity about, you know, what exactly needs to be done, what exactly needs to, you know, fit into that uh, settlement um, uh, is useful. Um, I mean, I don't think that it's useful when you're dealing with a very deceptive actor. Um, and so I think, you know, keeping some ambiguity about, you know, bringing back in the possibility of um, U.S. involvement, um, I, I think, uh, to back up some kind of peace talks, some kind of mediation, uh, you know, uh, is, is useful uh, be, because of the nature of the, uh, of the actor that the United States is, is uh, dealing with. Thank you. So some form of carrot, but also, you know, backed by a big stick, the yep. possibility of a big stick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? Europe? Europe, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, build a strong anti-coercion instrument. That's that's the obvious point uh, that I have to make. Um, uh, but, the, you know, there's still debate on the decision-making process. And I'll just say that in, in one sentence. Um, and, and member states obviously want to have a have a big say on on such tough countermeasures, uh, but they also need to keep in mind that it's important to be 
for this to be a, a, a you know, to, to an added benefit uh, uh, and to, to add to the EU's credibility that, that it can't be uh, under full control and that there can't, there can't be uh, uh, tricky processes. But that's just one thing. I think um, uh, uh, when, when Carla says um, uh, something that, that the, makes the pain stop, uh, something we can't forget, of course, on the central bank sanctions, that's not true, but on, but on many other sanctions, it's, as we've said, uh, throughout its private sector actors that actually implement the sanctions and make decisions. And, and uh, one lesson uh, from, from Iran, of course, is that um, uh, you can't promise too much that, uh, that new business relations will, will just, uh, you know, that, that trade will come back and that, and that the economy will flourish easily. So we're, we're in a situation where that's much less the case. But of course, unfreezing uh, central bank assets is, is something that, that can help very quickly. But it's also the big thing, um, so you don't want to give that, give that back very, very lightly. And then I think the other thing for Europeans is um, uh, is the China and obviously uh, transatlantic partners in general is the China question. Both with what do we do if if China did much more to help? That's that's been in the in the news and been discussed. But uh, but um, but concretely, you know, also for Europeans, I've. So some have asked me lately, should we not also do, don't we need extraterritoriality on European sanctions? But maybe that's uh, a step too far given the EU's position so, so far, so far, uh, and maybe it's other things. But, uh, but also the bigger question that we've touched on, I think, throughout the discussion is, okay, is this really a playbook for China and for, for in, in a similar situation or can you actually do that? I think we'll hit many more of the questions that we're currently hitting as, as Germans on energy in, in, in that case. Uh, and how far are we willing to go to, uh, in hurting ourselves and so forth. But that, so that's big questions and also a way of keeping the China topic um, uh, current. It's true. The big secondary section sanctions question looming out there. How do you enforce a trade embargo? Um, uh, Dan, last word. Quickly, because I have another sanctions panel I have to get to. Of course uh, you do. Yeah. Um, but I would say what I'm curious about is whether or not these are going to be institutionalized. Are you going to see some sort of institutional structure along the lines of what we saw with COCOM during the Cold War? Or in a more modern example or parable would be uh, the Financial Action Task Force, some sort of hybrid of those two that allows for not just the United States and, and the European Union, but other actors that have participated in these sanctions, Switzerland, Japan, you know, others, um, to potentially get on the same page to coordinate not just what you are seeing toward Russia, but again, this also would increase the deterrent power of what you're seeing. Because if it suggests that you're starting to see this kind of sanctioning mechanism get institutionalized, then there might be other actors that start looking at that and realizing um, what the implications of that might be for them. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we're four minutes over. Everybody has another panel we'll go to. <laughs> Thank you to, um, to the Dan who just dropped off, uh, to Jonathan, to Carla, um, and uh, and also to Maya, my my Nicolette, and my colleague here at the Atlanta Council for Logistical Side. Uh, thank you for indulging in this in this hour, and we'll see you next time. Bye.